Trauma is definitely a hot word in our society. Please explain the different types of traumatic experience that hinder people from being their best self. Yeah, trauma is definitely a buzzword. It's a hot topic today. Um, trauma can be anything. Anything that a person experiences, witnesses, perceives, that's another good one because the trauma is not necess doesn't necessarily have something to do with what you've gone through. It's your perception of a thing. So a trauma can be anything. But when we think about trauma, we typically think about, you know, those big ticket events like a death, uh, divorce, car accident, some major catastrophic event, um, natural disasters can be considered as traumatic. When I work with people in my practice, what I see most often is more developmental traumas, like things that happened to you in your childhood, in your past, that you're working to reconcile. And sometimes they're often unacknowledged. You don't even know that you've experienced a trauma. Um, sexual abuse, physical abuse, emotional abuse, spiritual abuse, all those are also considered traumas, but they don't often enter the treatment space. So we don't think about that as trauma when we think about treating people for trauma. Most people hear about the, or understand the physical abuse or sexual abuse. Can you give examples of emotional abuse? Emotional abuse is downbeating, talking to people in ways that are disrespectful, cursing at a person, telling you're nothing, you're not going to amount to anything. Anything that tends to wear your spirit down. That's emotional abuse. And what are some other uh, things that people don't acknowledge that are traumatic? One big one I'm thinking about right now is racism. You know, the effects, the reverberating effects of racism and oppression in this culture and also around the world. We don't think about that as being traumatic. People experience oppression, discrimination in almost all aspects of life. But again, we don't see them as traumatic because we don't think that they're, that we either don't acknowledge that they exist or we don't realize that they're impacting us in ways that they are. So that's a huge one that often goes unrecognized. Can you mention uh, what are five things people can do to heal their own trauma? Hmm. I think healing trauma starts with acknowledging it, understanding that it does exist. Again, a lot of us walk around with trauma and have no idea that we are traumatized. So acknowledging it, accepting it, that it is a reality is the beginning of the healing process. And when I think about healing trauma, I really think about it in terms of not something that you do personally yourself. That is down the road. I'm gonna talk about that a little bit. But for me, healing happens in community. Healing happens in the context of caring people who surround you and support you. I'm, I've been, made many trips to Africa and I'm remembering how no one in that culture was left to bear their burdens alone. The healing took place, whether it was drumming, whether it was singing, whether it was just in community, everything happens in the context of culture. So finding people who either have gone through or who is on the path, who has resolved their own trauma, doesn't have to necessarily be a therapist. I mean, I'm a therapist, I'm a little bit biased. However, you can find anyone who's on the path who has done the work to help you to resolve your trauma. Um, in the absence of people who, to support you, you have to become your own inner therapist. And that means, again, acknowledging your pain, recognizing that it exists, but then finding outlets and ways to express it health in healthy ways. I'm a drummer, I'm a drumaholic, <laughs> I sing, I dance, I do lots of things to support myself in the healing of anything that comes my way. So sometimes you have to go inward and do those practices that are gonna help you to resolve issues that are buried deep inside of us. And I guess in this case, we're calling them traumas. What are three things people can do to practice self-care? Ah, <laughs> self-care. You like those numbers, don't you? <laughs> Threes and fives. Uh, self-care. I can talk about self-care in, in two different ways. Self-care, for example, when I do trainings, I say the pie, I have come up with something called the pies model. P means physical, I is intellectual, E is emotional, S is spiritual. So trying to find balance in all of those areas. And then we're looking at different levels. So you can talk about self-care just in order to survive, for example, physically. If you eat, sleep, rest, you know, getting the basic needs covered, you will survive. But when you want to thrive, you have to go a little bit beyond that. Eating healthy foods, abstaining from practices, I think we were talking about a little bit earlier. 
So those, let's think about that. But I go beyond that when I think about self-care because self-care for me has to do with having healthy boundaries, knowing when to say no, knowing that you cannot be everything to everybody. That is a huge part because in this culture, you know, everything, do everything, you know, people pleasing down the line. But when you learn to take care of yourself, and in order to do that, you have to know yourself first. You have to know who you are and what your needs are. Most of us have absolutely no idea who we are, what we need, what we want, because we've been conditioned to care for everyone else. And so our needs get neglected. So self-care, knowing yourself, maintaining good boundaries and managing stress, I think, is another one, too. No, I, I wanted to say... Um... We're, we're with ourselves the most, but we know the least about ourselves. Hey, uh -uh. So what would you say that people can do realistically to learn more about themselves? I think sitting with yourself and being still, which is the most astronomically difficult thing in this culture to do. I don't see any way other than being with yourself, being comfortable with yourself. Most of us cannot sit still for two seconds. It takes an, it's an inward process. It's nothing outside of you that you need. And that's a, that's a deep statement, but you know, I, I can explain that maybe in another. <laughs> you don't need anything outside of yourself. And if you think of ourselves as a microcosm of the universe and the planet, everything that is ex exists outside of you is inside of you. Study yourself, go inward, find out what you want, what you need, what you desire. And you have to strip every role, you have to say, now, I'm not Dorothy the wife. I'm not Dorothy the drummer. I'm not Dorothy the psychologist. I'm not Dorothy the... Who am I in my essence? Essentially, fundamentally, who am I? Some of us have absolutely no idea because we've never taken time to investigate ourselves. We study everything, you know, but actually when you sit still, that's when all the pain shows up. That's when the demons come. You know, the stuff that you've been repressing and running from your entire existence it shows up, but it wants to be there. It wants to exist. It wants expression. It wants, it's like I feel this little girl inside of me before I found who I was, just crying for attention. You know, Shaha, I'm here. Don't keep running away from me. I'm here, I want to express myself. I wanna show you who I am. But you will never be able to take care of yourself if you don't know what you need and you don't know who you are. You'll always be at the end of a string that someone else pulls, Howard Thurman. You will never be able to, you know, take care of yourself if you don't know what you need. How much of an impact does systemic racism have on the psyche of black people in America? I take pause on that one right there. <laughs> it has an incredibly large impact on the black psyche. If you think about every institution, every system in this culture is designed consciously or unconsciously we're aware of it, consciously or unconsciously, to oppress people who are not in the dominant culture. I know that's a heavy, heavy, bold statement, but if you think about it, reflect on the education system, employment, incarceration, housing, everything you can think of, birth rates, death rates, where do we stand? Is that by, I mean, do you have to look at like, it's us? You know, a lot of us think, well, you know, either pull yourself up by your bootstraps or this is something that you are doing to create your own demise. You have to start to look systemically. You have to. People in my psychotherapy practice, I work specifically with low income populations. That's where I come from and I like to give back to that. People who can't afford expensive therapy. My rates are very low. I work with Medicaid and Medicare clients specifically intentionally because and i feel i can you can feel the pain you can feel that simple things like not getting adequate schooling going to schools and looking at the conditions the material that children are learning the lack of resources that's just a small example and they're expected to compete in the broader world but we blame them you know, we blame them for their poverty when we know that the system is designed to keep you poor. You can't run from that. You can't look at a whole race of people. And of course, you know, some crawl out, right? <laughs> we don't want to talk about the crab pot, but some do get out. But it's, just, it's the system and I think it weighs heavily. And we think about what happened to George Floyd and countless other 
African Americans who've been murdered, you know, whose voices were stifled, who just through everyday existence, that has to weigh on you. You can't wake up every day and not be affected by that. So it has a huge impact on our mental health. And the biggest impact I've witnessed as an educator is not feeling worthy of anything mm. and confidence. I think that's the biggest crippler of systemic racism because people don't believe they can do anything. That's right. And they don't think they're worthy of anything. Mm. I think like that's like the biggest trap we don't so talk about, you know. Very, very well spoken. Very true. Because, again, we've been conditioned to believe that. Everything black is what? Negative, it's dirty, it's pejorative, but white is angelic and it's snow and it, you know, that's, that's an age old thing. Like we can expand on that, expand on that for decades because it's, it's ingrained. Even if you look at the Bible, look in biblical times, you know, ham, it's just, it, it's, it runs very deep. And you can't think about black and white without thinking about what that does. When you say a black person, you're dirty, you're less than, you're less intelligent, even in psychology. You know, the, the tests that were developed all to suppress and make you think that you were less than. You're not worthy. You're not, you don't belong in the room. You don't belong in this space. Your voice is not as significant as the majority voices. Your hair is not, you know, you know what I'm saying, down the line, you considered that we're less than. and we. Sad part is a lot of us have bought into that. We believe that we internalize it and we act accordingly. Please explain why you believe talk therapy alone is not enough to help people heal from traumatic experiences. Mm, yeah. I'm a talk therapist by training. So of course I believe in talk therapy. However, when people experience traumatic events, trauma is not stored in the language part of the brain. Trauma is stored in the limbic system, that emotional part of the brain. The, the language part of the brain, the prefrontal cortex, where language is stored, our intellect is housed, our reasoning and judgment. At the time of trauma, that part goes offline. Think about it. You're being chased by a dog. Let's just give a simple example. All the energy is going to flood to your extremities because you need that energy to run, to flee, or to fight right? If you can't run and if you can't fight, something called the fight, flight, freeze, and now fawn syndrome, you freeze and the energy is trapped in your body. No amount of talk therapy is going to help you to release that. That's one reason because trauma is not stored in the language part of the brain. It's stored in the body. So healing trauma takes a bodily process, the drumming, the different stuff I talked about. Also talk is taboo. You know, <laughs> you don't talk about, for my case, I experienced developmental trauma in my own household, in my family. You don't talk about, you don't, you know, air your dirty laundry out in the street. You don't, you don't sit, how many people gonna go and sit in front of a therapist and say, oh yeah, this happened. Most people are not gonna do that. And all, yeah, that's really not likely to happen. And sometimes talk therapy can be re-traumatizing to ask a person to revisit and to keep talking about it. It almost puts you viscerally in that same place where you were. So we have to start thinking about healing trauma from the bottom up. That means start with the body and then you work your way up to the top. But in our Western model, we've been trained to work from the top down. You start with the words and you talk and then you, you eventually come down and then the words will often release you. That doesn't work like that with trauma. Trauma is trapped. It's stuck. It's trying to get out. And the experience of trauma and stress, it remains with you. And every time you experience a subsequent trauma, it builds. These are hormones that are in our bodies. They are stuck and they're trapped. When you don't release them, they're, where are they going? They stay there. And when you see people walk around tight all the time, they're angry, they're frustrated, they have road rage, it's like all this stuff inside of them is trapped in that they just need permission to be allowed to release it. In a therapy session, allow your clients, I don't even sit, you know what, this doesn't exist. I don't have an office where clients come and sit down. Druid Hill Park is one of my offices. We do walk and talk, right? I'm working with a client who's traumatized. He's raging. I'm in his house. We're, we're bouncing a ball back and forth. It's not just this frozen state because it's kind of like, you know, I'm expecting you to talk about 
what happened to you? No, it doesn't start there. And when you start to release and heal that pain, when you start to release those powerful, potentially dangerous emotions that are trapped in your body, now maybe, now maybe you can start to talk about trauma. And trauma doesn't necessarily need talk to be healed, believe that or not. Yeah. All right. I want to say, what is an example of releasing trauma from your body? Woo! Where's my girl? <laughs> Sophia. No, I'm drumming. Okay. I can, I can tell you anything physically. Well, I, I'll talk about this. Drumming. Let's start with that. Brrr, anything that gets you moving, your body moving, singing, resonating. You're breaking up blockages. Yoga, dance, writing, writing about trauma. You don't have to necessarily speak it. You can write about it. I write poetry. I do something called drumetry. I write poems in September African drum rhythms. That releases it. You know, when you write about a trauma and put a different ending on it, write a story, you can, that's another way to heal trauma. Being in nature. Oh my goodness. That vitamin D, this here, this oxygen we're breathing in, anything that breaks it up. But when you're frozen, you're in a therapist's office, you're pretty much like this, frozen, you're stuck. But you can release it walking, taking walks. It, it costs nothing, jogging, running, anything that you can think about that shakes up that energy, that brings it out of your body and out here. It has to come out of you. Please tell me about the importance of the drum in African history first then i want you to speak about when did you start using the drum for therapy so let's talk about the history first ah okay drumming uh, i told you i'm a drumaholic so i'm gonna be real biased on this african drumming has been around since i think the beginning of time and you can think about they always um, equate it to or give an example of women pounding you know anything that's rhythmic you know the drum came a little bit later but drumming serves a hugely important role in African society. I'm thinking of anything from plowing in the fields that was accompanied by drumming, connecting with spirit, using, you're using drumming. Drumming is also used as a form of communication where they would send messages from village to, to village playing a certain pattern. There's a rhythm called dunumba, drum rhythm was a warrior and you play the dunumba and people know it's time to go to battle. You know, just almost like, you know, in the, our modern day times when you have the, the minute men, I guess what they're called, the drummers in front of a line in the drum line, all of that. It, drumming is communicating. And that's why drumming was banned during slavery because they could use drums to incite a rebellion. They could use drums to communicate. You didn't use, need to use your voice, you could use a drum. So drumming is very, very important. And to this day, it serves a hugely important function in African and almost all cultures now because everybody has. <laughs> so when did you start using the drum for therapy? Now, when I say this, I can say it consciously and unconsciously because I've been drumming ever since I was in my mother's womb because, you know, it's a trite expression, but my mother's drum beat was the first drum that I heard. So I've been listening to that rhythm. Somehow, when, when I was a little girl, I remember at elementary school, I would always get in trouble for playing on the desk, you know? And the teacher would make you sit on your hands and I'm playing in my head, you know? It's, it's something about the drum that I've always been attracted to. And, and I've joined an African drumming company here, or actually African dance and drumming company in Baltimore years ago, many, many Dorothys ago. And women weren't allowed to drum. Yeah, there's so many taboos around that. We could talk about that at a later time, but women weren't allowed to drum. But I went to Africa. I didn't see women drumming because that, you know, that notion stems from Africa. But there's this urge inside of me to drum. So, and at the end of a dance class, you have a lot of women. Stereotypically, the men will be drumming and the women, they'll form a solo circle. And all the women go out there and they show their solos what they learned in class. And I was always sitting with the drummers. There's something about it. And I'm... I can do the same syncopation. I'm playing the patterns that they're playing, you know, but I wasn't allowed to drum. So I went to Africa and I came back and there was an African dance class downtown, Baba Carr and Jai. He was having a Senegalese class and I had my drums in the car with trepidation. I walked up and said, Baba, can I drum for class? She said, Dr. Don, of course, go get your drum shot. I mean, I skipped steps running down to my car. I got the drums and I started playing the June Junes in the class. I felt so great. He allowed me to drum in his class. 
He allowed anyone to drum so a woman could drum and climb almost in tears right now. So thank you, Baba Khan Jai. He allowed me to drum and I started drumming in his class, African drumming class. And he, classes are an hour or better. You're drumming for an hour and a half, you're sweating. And the crazy thing is the more I drum, the more energy I got. It was insane. So in my band, I'm in a band called Roses and Rust. I drum, play um, African drums in the band, have a nonprofit where we integrate mental health in the arts. I play the drums. I started formally drumming in Baba Khan's class. And that was over like 10, 15 years. I don't even know when the date was, but that's when I started for it. And I never stopped from there. I picked it up and I'm like, and then I've Baba Dom in DC. He invited me to come. He said, Dr. Dot, you know, you have a gift. You need to come to DC and drum. So I went to his classes in DC and then he taught me the gym there. I started working with him. And Baba Baile McKnight, who's also an icon in our community, I started drumming with Baile, slowly but surely. Started to jump and I found healing. Drumming heals me at every level. It's cellular healing. It's cellular, it's vibrational medicine is what I call it. You can feel what you felt. The drum resonates through your whole body and it integrates the left brain, the right brain. Nothing escapes it. Every part of your body is transformed and healed when you drum. I want to drum right now. No, I'm joking. I love it. Passionate. Yeah. Why are so many people experiencing anxiety and depression in America? <sighs> you got the heaviest questions. <laughs> anxiety and depression in America. I, I look at that at a lot of different levels as well. Um, I think about our culture, first of all, the Western culture, not just in America, but America's, I think we have a corner in this market. This fast paced, technologically complicated, got to have it all, do it all right now culture that we live in is almost a recipe for anxiety. There's very few people who can escape from the time you get up in the morning to the time you go to bed at night. Most people are caught up in this system. You're running, you're struggling, you got to get up, you got to go, you feed the kids, you get it, and you never get a chance to just be, to be still and to rest. That's where the meditation comes, becomes important. So anxiety, absolutely, we're anxious. And then the other part that feeds into that anxiety, this whole culture of competition as opposed to cooperation. You know, we gotta be better. We gotta, be, I think about even children. What happened to kindergarten, pre-K, early K, all these, you know, these, we force children into achieving and at very early ages, they can't even be kids anymore because they have to produce and you gotta, every moment of your life and you're thought to, okay, again, conditioned to believe that if you're not doing something, you're nothing. So your value comes from what you do. When I'm in cultures or in, in environments, people are like, the first thing like, what do you do? Oh my God, my husband, he's funny. When people ask him that, he says, oh, I'm a garbage collector. Right? No, he's not. I'm telling you. And people, you can see them slowly. <laughs> it's just insane. Nothing has to do with who we are as people. So I think that whole culture of competition, and then you look at social media, you're looking at people who, you know, whose lives aren't really what they're portraying in most cases, but you're comparing yourself. You're looking through that lens. You're saying, I'm not measuring up. So you're, you're angry. You got to do this. You got to do that. I got to put this content out. I got to do this. I got to do this. And it's like, no, be, just be. But our culture doesn't allow that. The Western world does not allow that, right? Okay, so that's one reason. Depression, I think, also stems from thinking you need to be somewhere or do something that you're not. I think when you accept yourself 100%, all of your gifts, all of your limitations, self-acceptance comes first. If I'm accepting and loving myself, I don't really have that much time to be depressed. Now, let's be honest. There is something called clinical depression. Some people are, they have a chemical imbalance in the brain. I can't explain it because I don't understand it myself, but it's said that like you think about chemical imbalance, I don't want to dismiss anyone who suffers from a true clinical depression. No, that's real. There's something called seasonal affective disorder. You know, sometimes in certain seasons, people get depressed. There's situational depression. Your mom died, my mom died. I'm going to be depressed, obviously, but after a certain time, you know, we don't label that, you know, so depression, I think, stems largely from our perceptions. What is not right? What is wrong? You know, if I'm thinking about where I'm not and I'm thinking about what I need, I'm thinking about I don't have this and have that. I've been to Africa many times. It's rare for me to see 
a person in Africa depressed. I'm not saying it doesn't exist. Again, they're surrounded with culture. They have community. They're not there alone. You know, there's no competition. Everyone's helping and supporting each other. You know, where's the time for depression? And also, and I'll, this is gonna be sound a little bit off, but depression sometimes for me is a disease of affluence. When you have a whole lot and, you know, why are people in America depressed if you're depressed about your circumstance and your situation? You have everything. They look at me like, you can go home and just pluck that money off your tree. What are you sad about? If I had what you have, well, anyway, so anyway. That, I, that's, I know it's a complicated question and that's a little bit of a, you know, I'm just giving my take on why people are depressed in America. I think America gives you a lot of reasons to be depressed. We can always go back to the racial discrimination. That's a source of depression. Also, that's also very real. Again, some people don't even recognize it and some people don't even acknowledge that it exists. But when you become aware, you know, of the forces that are against you, it's a source of depression also. But I think self-love, self-acceptance, that's what I help people to work, you know, to work on. Yeah, depression doesn't have a chance easily to escape in when you can look at life more realistically and you can look at things from a perspective of, I am enough already. I am enough. What else do I need to do? Thank <laughs> you.